great. So thank you all for coming out on this uh, day nearly before AGU. I'm sure you all have lots of other things to do. Um, so a visit from David Darmafo is a professor at MIT. I'm really excited to see how we can learn from the work they've been doing and they can learn from some of the work we've been doing. Um, Dave is a professor in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT, so not as much a traditional atmospheric science program, but his principal areas of interest are in computational methods for partial differential equations, so there's obviously a lot of overlap in what we do. Um, started off with a bachelor's in aerospace engineering from the University of Michigan and then got his PhD from MIT. Um, David's interested in pursuing a sabbatical here next year, and so we're trying to use this visit in part just to get him to meet a lot of people here and see which connections make sense. So again, thank you all for coming out, and if anybody's interested in meeting with him at some point tomorrow, there's still a, a little bit of time available, um, but at some point you would probably like to catch your airplane home too. Uh, David's won numerous awards for teaching and research, and so I'm really excited to see his talk. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. So uh, you can hear me okay? Good. Um, first, I want to thank Ethan. Um, is it on? It's not on. <laughs> okay. No, it's not. On. Now, now you can probably even hear me better. Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank Ethan. Um, I, uh, I've got a couple of slides, just sort of backdrop, because I'm trying to want to set the context for the, the visit. But um, uh, I reached out to a few people, and Ethan uh, I came back and um, really kind of uh, helped organize everything and um, really appreciate the opportunity to come here. So um, the talk is um, about some adaptive um, methods that we've been developing in our group. Um, the motivations started out in aerospace, but I'll, I'm going to show you mostly results. Uh, I'll show you some aerospace, but I'm going to show you a result from uh, porous media reservoir simulation in particular, um, and I'll tell a little story about that. Um, the uh, reason for the visit, though, is really to try and I've got a sabbatical coming up, like Ethan said. And my intention is to, during that sabbatical, try and shift towards looking at environmental focused uh, um, simulation uh, numerical methods for them. So um, uh, I'd like to come to a place like this where uh, that's what happens uh, daily, um, is, is modeling and simulation of uh, atmospheric climate modeling, uh, other things. And so. Um, while the talk, I tried to pick out some things that I thought might be of most interest uh, to the group. Uh, I'm also not saying that I want to come here and work on this while I'm here. I would like to learn and work on problems that uh, hopefully can help you in the short term, but also help me learn to um, uh, what's, what are the pacing issues in the, in the field. So with that, I did want to just give a little bit of backdrop. So that's the context. Um, my background is largely numerical methods for aerospace engineering. Um, I told you about the pivot uh, time frame, summer to next summer, roughly. Um, I've said all of that. So background, uh, Ethan gave some of this too. I did my undergraduate at University of Michigan. I heard there was a Ohio State person here, uh, um, unfortunately. Uh, so um, PhD was at MIT, master's and PhD at MIT. Uh, there, I worked on scientific visualization techniques for CFD in um, my master's. And then um, while I used CFD to look at this, it was really a study of the mechanisms of vortical flows, vortex breakdown uh, in vortical flows. Um, so that was a uh, finite difference code uh, um, that I developed at that point. Um, Advisor was Earl Merman. Then I did a postdoc back at University of Michigan uh, for a couple of years. Uh, worked on local preconditioning and multigrid methods, um, mostly looking at finite volume discretizations uh, at that point. Um, and my advisor, postdoc advisor, was uh, Brown Van Leer uh, during that period. Um, professor first at Texas A&M for a few years, uh, then at MIT since uh, 98, so 20-ish years. Um, Roughly speaking, the three main areas I've worked on in my time uh, at both of these places were higher order adaptive CFD methods, the thing I'll talk about today, um, robust design of turbo, turbo machinery. So here looking at how does, in particular, say, variability due to manufacturing, variability due to wear, uh, 
or variability due to the fact that the conditions you're flying through um, uh, are different every day? How do those changes impact the way the engine performs? Um, and how would you design differently um, if you tried to account for that uncertainty or those variabilities? Um, and then uh, a lot of work in engineering education, um, not, not meaning just the teaching of classes, but trying to actually think about how we can improve uh, education. Um, so that, that's kind of a quick synopsis. All right, so now uh, the technical uh, side of things. So I'm going to talk about output-based or goal-oriented adaptation. Um, and the framework here, uh, oops, sorry about that. The framework for an adaptive method is you describe the problem you're interested in. In the output case, you describe an output or a set of outputs you might be interested in. So my typical uh, aerospace-centric talk would be you want to find uh, the drag on the airplane or how much lift the airplane is going to generate. And so a handful of outputs that you're interested in from that simulation in particular, and you specify some level of error that you're willing to live with. I'm willing to live with a tenth of a percent error in the drag, or, or maybe it's one percent error in the drag. You also specify some amount of time that you're willing to let the computer work at it, or maybe it's memory or whatever it might be, some measure of work, and say, all right, this is the maximum amount of uh, resource I have. Start by calculating the solution and these outputs on an initial grid. Um, estimate the error in those outputs, and I'll talk a little bit about how, how that's done. Um, and then based on that error, decide, all right, uh, did we meet the tolerance that was requested? And if not, if we have time, resource left, adapt the error to control the error, and start the process over again. So it's basically, it's a classic adaptive uh, method. The only thing we're um, going to, uh, it's not unique. One of the things that's uh, in interesting here is this idea of using outputs um, to drive the process. So, so that's the idea. Um, Here's an example. Uh, so I, I'm gonna, the first kind of set of examples are going to be the aerospace ones. So uh, uh, this is a classic airfoil that's studied in, uh, it's one of those that, OK, anybody that solves this class of problems is going to have to simulate this airfoil uh, when you develop a new code. So it's a classic problem. Uh, this is Reynolds average Navier-Stokes. So we're modeling turbulence. We're not doing anything like large eddy simulation here. This is going to solve for the mean turbulent variables. Uh, um, this is the particular uh, turbulence model, Spillard Mars, we're using. This is a flow that's at Mach 0.729. There's going to be a shock wave that gets generated. It's a transonic flow, and you'll see the shock appearing. You can sort of see it in this very coarse solution here right now. So this is a plot of the Mach number solved on this very bad, inappropriate mesh. At this Reynolds number, there are going to be very, very thin boundary layers here. The thickness of this boundary layer is, is something like 1 1,000th, 1 1,100th, uh, sorry, 1 Ten thousandth of the length of that cord of the airfoil. Okay, so we're going to need to resolve this really thin layer, uh, and obviously this this meshing is not going to do it, right? But the um, way this works, this whole process works, is uh, we calculate the flow, um, we calculate what is called the drag coefficient, right? So a non-dimensional form of the drag, and this is the uh, number in what's called a count of drag. So uh, 176 is what the solution tells you. The error estimation process we have says, well, you shouldn't trust it because this is how much error I think you have possibly in here. It's, a, it's not a bound technically. Um, but you can see that there's a problem because this number is larger than this, which means that it, this could even predict negative values uh, um, being possible. So there's more error than there is actual drag. We, this is not a good solution, right? OK, that, that's clear. What I'm plotting over here is the true error, now the only reason we know the true error is we ran this simulation enough times on a really, uh, we just really fine mesh, killed it so we know what the answer is to this problem. And no, generally speaking, you don't know. I'm just plotting it. I'm not using what the error, what the actual value is for the drag in the adaptive process. This is just to show you how the adaptive process does converge eventually to the right answer. Okay. So that's a plot of, of the error. So the error is huge. Um, after about five iterations or so, this is what the mesh has done through the adaptive process. Um, it's started to resolve the boundary layer. It started to put resolution in where the shock wave is appearing, and the solution is, is noticeably better. You can see this is this mock number here. You can see the blue values are where the boundary layer is, and then downstream of it where the wake is shed. And then another a little while later, and you can see uh, the error estimate is still large. It's not 
larger now than the estimated drag, the actual drag, but, and you keep going, and eventually you get to the point where you're what, where you want it to be. Um, so in this case, this is a little bit less than a percent uh, error. So that's, that's how this, this works. Um, let me give you a little bit more uh, idea of, of how it actually works. The uh, results I'm gonna mostly talk about today, we're using a discontinuous Galerkin finite element method for. Um, so in a 1D setting, um, we have uh, polynomials on elements that are not required to be continuous as you move from element to element. So the solution might look something like this in a 1D problem with jumps between the elements. Um, we have some equation we're trying to solve. So here might be our uh, Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations with a advective inviscid flux term, uh, a viscous term in it, and then source terms. And um, this, most of the source terms are where the turbulence modeling is, is done, okay? So that's the PDE that we're solving. So what we can do is we can substitute our analytic solution into that PDE and see what's left over. There'll be some residual, so define the residual and we're gonna substitute in that residual and maybe that looks like this in blue here. So we've got a pointwise value of what the remainder is when we plug our solution back into the partial differential equations we're solving. All right, so that, that's, there's no approximation there in the sense that that is a truncation error. There, there is an error you can directly calculate it from the um, solution that you have. Now the question is how do you act on that? And so what we wanna then do is turn somehow we wanna understand how do these local residuals impact the thing we care about, the drag in this particular example I was looking at. So the connection there is, is uh, to use um, uh, duality and use an adjoint uh, to actually relate the source term, this truncation error residual, to the output of interest. So um, J being the output of interest, U being the exact solution, comparing it to the J evaluated with these, this finite element solution or wherever you get it, is approximately equal to the integral of the adjoint multiplying that residual that you calculated. So if I can calculate this adjoint, integrate over the domain this source term, the residual, I have an estimate for the error. The approximation comes in for a few different reasons. Uh, um, one is uh, that I've, uh, this is a linearized type of a, a approximation. Uh, there are technically ways you can make this nonlinear, but they're impractical in, in process. So, so there's sort of a linearization underneath the hood here. And there's a little bit of uh, slop in what I've done. This is not quite right, because you have to account for boundary conditions not being satisfied potentially also. And so there'd be a boundary error term I haven't included in this math. But it, that's the basic idea is. Uh, solve for the adjoint, weight the residual with the adjoint, and that's uh, with a, mostly a linearization issue, um, uh, an estimate for the error, okay. So now what we can do is this is an integral over the domain. I can say, all right, in this element, here's how much the residual contributes to an error in my drag or whatever it is I might be interested in. So now I have an error in every element uh, in terms of how does this truncation error contribute to an accuracy of the drag or whatever my output is. Okay, so psi here is this adjoint uh, for whatever output I happen to pick. And of course, uh, uh, this, this type of thing, not the error estimate part, but adjoint analysis is a, uh, a part of climate modeling and uh, weather modeling in particular, uh, weather predictions through data assimilation techniques and uh, specifically. So, um, uh, Data simulation techniques were being used well before the first adjoint use was appeared in aerospace CFD. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a connection there between that adjoint being used for data simulation, or in this case, the adjoint being used for in quantifying how much error is being made. Okay, so the issue here is, this is true also if the psi, we have it, we don't have the exact psi, so I've got to solve for the adjoint as well. You know about solving for adjoints for data simulation purposes, so now I'm not only solving my fluid flow problem, but I'm also solving the adjoint equations for that fluid flow problem to do this error estimate. Okay, so I've left a lot unsaid there, but that's, that's basically how this uh, error estimate works. Now a little bit about how the additivity uses that error estimate. What we actually do is we solve an optimization problem the optimization problem you might think that we could solve would be this one stated here, which is I've got some unstructured mesh, and I wanna find um, a mesh, so this is this TH here, uh, 
that produces the smallest amount of error subject to some costs, like um, I want to use 100,000 elements or whatever my cost might be. And so that's, that's something you could think about doing, but because that's a discrete optimization problem, that's basically not, not going to be solvable. So what we do instead is an idea that was suggested uh, by Adrien Lezé in, uh, from INRIA in France, um, is we think of a metric field instead that describes the mesh that we have. And the idea behind the metric field is, uh, sorry, it's a um, scaling of the XY space so that um, if you were to make the mesh unit under that metric, so you measure distance now with using this metric, um, if you make the lengths of the edges unit under the metric, you would produce uh, the elements that you're interested in. So there's a, you can think of a metric as an ellipse, right? And this is the mapping of at the center of this ellipse, how much, how long is the unit direction in each of these, right? So this would say I'd like elements that will be shaped, roughly speaking, like this ellipse. And if you come over here, you can see kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence between the mesh that's generated and this metric field. So what we do when we do this uh, adaptivity is we actually solve an optimization problem for a metric. And that metric is defined over the entire domain, okay, uh, all space. And then we toss that metric over to uh, a, a mesh adaptation program that can produce a mesh that matches that metric. Okay. So the advantage here is now I have a continuous problem for this metric field that I can actually solve. It's a continuous optimization problem. Okay. So what do I need to solve that continuous optimization problem? I need to know somehow how does my error, my output error in this case, depend on changes in the mesh, which is how does the error depend on the metric itself? Okay. So the way we do that is we actually sample the solution. So we'll go to an element. So this is, say, the initial element, kappa 0. And this is the metric. This is an isotropic element the way I drawn it. So the metric for the initial element is a circle, then, in that case. I split the metric. So I k1, kappa 1 is the first split that I do. And then I'm going to resolve just that local element. I'm not going to resolve the global problem. I'm just going to resolve the local element, subject to boundary conditions basically uh, um, outside being frozen. So it's a flux-based boundary condition we use here but we just resolved this problem on the subdivided local mesh. And that allows us to calculate a new error based on that subdivision. And we have a new metric that corresponds to these elements here. And so now I have this pairing of what did the error do when I did this split and resolved, and what was the effect on the metric. And now I can build a model. Okay. And so basically that's what we do is we go to every element. Uh, in the 2D setting, we would sample uh, all three of these directions you see here. This is a small local solve. It's very parallel because it doesn't depend on solving the global problem. I can go to each element and do it independently. Um, so in that sense, it's a, a cheap part of the, the method. By the way, uh, if you have questions in the middle, uh, feel free to raise a hand and, and ask questions as we go along. Um, so I produce pairs of the uh, error. And in this case, the error is just the local integral of that adjoint times the residual. Okay. And then I have a way to fit this, this pair of information through a least squares type process to an error model between the um, metric and this error that we've estimated. Okay, and I, I can give you some more details about how we do it, but that's, that's basically it. So end of this, for every element I have, how does the error depend on what that shape of the element looks like? And now what I can do is I can plug all that into the optim to an optimizer and say, all right, tell me what the metric should look like that pr produces the minimum error for some fixed amount of cost, so a fixed number of elements, for example. OK, and that's, that's all cheap in the sense that if we're solving nonlinear compressible flow equations, three dimensions or more, uh, um, that's a, the cost is in that. The cost is not solving an optimization problem of uh, a fairly well-behaved problem. So, you can afford to do this um, uh, compared to everything else that you have to do. So the whole process then looks like this. You solve the flow and adjoint on a current grid. You determine this error metric model through the local sampling. You optimize the metric. You toss that optimized metric over to uh, a mesher that can actually generate a mesh that matches that metric. Okay. So that's how those other meshes were generated. I'm just showing you real quick one other uh, case. This is a 3D case, the flow is a flow coming in at an angle of attack of what's known as the 
hemis uh, hemisphere cylinder test case that's a popular test case right now for doing Reynolds average Navier-Stokes simulations. Um, and so what you can see here is a uh, mesh that is stretched. I'm sorry, I was going to use this. Um, before I tell you what the difference between the left and the right is, let's just look at this. You can see a mesh that's highly stretched in the axial direction because the flow doesn't change all that much in the axial direction here. There's a reasonable amount of variation around the circumference here. There's a very thin boundary layer. And what you see here is actually there's a vortex that's shed because of the separation as the flow tries to come around this cylinder. It separates, and you can see a... Uh, evidence of a shear layer rolling into a vortex back here just by looking at the way the additivity is behaving. And what you're seeing here is, is not the boundary layer, but actually the, the, the two vortices, uh, you know, this is a half of it spinning and um, counter-rotating. And so this is refining the, that kind of in-between region between the vortices. Okay, so um, 3D simulation, same technique that we were talking about. The other thing I just wanted to point out here is the, this is, uh, sorry, using two different discretizations now. The right-hand side is the discontinuous Galerkin discretization. This is a solution that achieves about 1% error in the drag. It uses 500,000 uh, degrees of freedom to do that simulation. We have been recently working on a continuous Galerkin method using a discretization uh, known as variational multiscale with discontinuous subscales, mouthful. Uh, it's a brand new thing for us, but it's something that uh, John Evans over here from CU um, uh, was a key developer in, and uh, we've just finally latched onto it, and it's made a world of difference for us. Why do I say that? Um, what you see here is this is also a 1% error. So these have essentially the same error. Um, they have about the same number of elements. This has a few more elements than that one does. But the big thing that matters here is the degrees of freedom. We've almost dropped by an order of magnitude the degrees of freedom, and we get the same error uh, as the discontinuous solution. And what's happening here is there's a lot of duplication of unknowns when you do DG, uh, because every face that you share in common sort of has multiple values from both elements. And that's a duplication of unknowns when most of this flow you're expecting to be smooth. Uh, there's no reason to expect a discontinuous solution is going to give you a lot of advantage in representing that solution. And in fact, that's what we see in practice. It's really about the elements uh, um, that matter. And since CG, a continuous Galerkin disc uh, discretization is more efficient, going to be way cheaper in terms of degrees of freedom. So um, this is something we've been trying to do for a while, and it wasn't until this we, we kind of latched onto this method that we finally have a way to really realize that um, uh, benefit. So, so while 10 years or so of our work has been on DG methods, this is where we're really headed now is to a continuous finite element method. OK. I should mention these solutions here. Um, these are linear polynomials right here, so we're not actually using higher order, but um, other cases I'll be showing some higher order results. Okay, so Nate, does a factor of 10 get you closer to a factor of 10 in terms of the cost? Yeah, great question. So um, right now, uh, of course, this is our implementation that you have to uh, uh, you know, factor in. Uh, this is, I'd have to go back and look. I think it's more like a factor of five in uh, CPU time uh, that we're getting. But we, there's a lot that we've left uh, under that we need to do better on. So um, I think it might have been with you I was talking about this with. This is, these are parallel solutions that done on a uh, you know, distributed system. And we've honed that parallelization to work well with DG. And it, it works well in DG because it turns out the cost of the linear solve and the residuals scale with the number of elements uh, for, for DG, both the linear solve and the uh, residual. In CG, the residual scales with the number of elements, but the DOS scale with, if you will, the number of vertices. And so now what that means is this linear solve is, if you want to parallelize for the um, residual, you're way finer than the linear solve would want to be. If you parallelize to have a kind of effective, as few of iterations as possible on a linear, then you've got processors which are working too hard to do the residual calculation, right? So. Anyway, so I think there's a lot of stuff left under the hood. I don't think we'll get a factor of 10 because you will need a few more elements here than you will uh, there. You get a little benefit from the discontinuous solution space. Um, I think we'll get, when it's all said and done, close to the factor 10, but not quite. It'll be, you know, factor 8 or something like that. So right now we're at like factor 5. But okay. Um, all right, finally, uh, multi-scale uh, time-dependent phenomena. So 
Um, I was doing this work with our group and uh, sitting in my office about 10 years ago and I uh, got a knock on the door and the knock on the door was from uh, a research fellow at a, uh, um, a petroleum company and uh, said, you know, I've got a problem. And uh, we don't know how to generate meshes to solve our uh, um, reservoir uh, flow problems uh, accurately. And I'm going to show you a little evidence of that in a second. And uh, sat down and said, we'd like to invest some time and research in this area of applying adaptivity to reservoir simulations. So um, of course, uh, reservoir simulations are all about time-dependent problems. It's, you know, how, you've got to see how the oil or other things are flowing in and out of the ground. And um, so we have to go to a time-dependent problem. Um, just a bit about the scale. So this is a picture of a, of a typical reservoir and well system and fractures. It's got kind of a whole bunch of uh, features in it. By the way, most of the time the meshes in this, uh, I, I didn't know any of this uh, until we got into it, but most of the time the meshes here are um, the same in the z direction, and it's the adaptivity occurs only in the horizontal uh, plane. So that's uh, similar to, to, to some things that happen in atmospheric simulations too. S length scales: the reservoirs are 10 to 100 kilometers typically. Fractures that you might want to resolve are uh, 100 to 1,000 meters, and then of course the wells and the pipes uh, um, are 1 to 100 meters. Depends on whether you're looking at diameters and lengths and things like that, but these, these are the numbers you're talking about. So this is like a 10 to the fifth type range on the length scales. Time scales are worse. They try to simulate predictions that are on the decades. Um, you have rock matrices uh, flows in the rocks that are typically day-long type phenomena that can occur. And then the flows inside the pipes themselves have phenomena that occur at the, at the level of seconds. So that's like a 10 to the ninth-ish or so time scale range that they're interested in. So a multi-scale problem. And then here's just a little evidence of the issue. Um, the old simulation capability back about 10 years ago, uh, more like 15 years ago, was to simulate a typical water, sorry, a typical reservoir with about 10 million cells in it. And so that would be, uh, this is just a, obviously a chunk of that cell. And what's being shown here is the water saturation. So the way they plot that is it's blue if it's all water. Um, and if it's oil, it's red. Um, other plots put the oil in green um, for the, the, the dollars associated with it. But at any rate, uh, uh, this is red, right? So uh, blue is water. That's the way they used to simulate things. And then over a, a period of about five years, they invested a lot of time parallelizing their code more effectively. Uh, of course, parallel computers got better as well. And they were able to bump up their simulations to be standard work now is like a billion cell type simulation for them. OK, so and when they did that, you know, you get results, same problem that look like this. And suddenly you see a lot more resolution. You've got oil in places you didn't think you had. Um, and they use these to then make decisions about where they're going to be drilling, how they're going to be pumping things out of the ground, how they're going to pressurize, the time scales at which they do that. And if the simulations are missing oil or leaving oil behind, that's a lot of money. And so you, know, you can really quickly estimate what it is. And roughly speaking, a bad decision based on a reservoir simulation could cost a company easily $500 million on, in one reservoir. And so basically, his, his management came to him and said, we have a lot of money to spend on getting this right. Um, go find people that might be able to help. And so that's what happened. He walked in my office, and that's when we started working on this problem. Um, so uh, the way I'm going to talk about solving it um, is a, a space-time-based uh, approach. And I just want to kind of put a cartoon out for how this method works. Um, you could think of refinement of a, here's a spatial, 1D spatial domain, and here's the time domain. You could think about uniform refinement in space and time. And what I'm showing you here is, let's say we have some feature that propagates um, you know, across that space-time domain. And we think of that feature having some length scale delta. So that's sort of the thickness or the radius or whatever it might be of that feature that you're trying to calculate. And um, you're going to simulate that thing. It's going to cross the, most of the domain. And that domain is, say, length L. Okay. Um, so here's a uniform refinement case. Um, here's a classic sort of way of doing it, uh, AMR type style with here called tensor product, where you refine locally and space and time, but you always are doing it so that there's a time plane uh, 
at some uh, instance that you're going to. And so there's a local refinement, and eventually the time planes match up with each other, and you refine wherever that feature is that you're trying to track. A full-blown unstructured space-time method would be this, where you say, all right, I don't care about lining up with time planes. I'm not going to do time marching. I'm actually going to discretize in space-time simultaneously. So in this 2D, 1D space plus time setting, my mesh is going to be triangles. If I do uh, a 3D problem in space, this is where the issue is, is now I've got to generate a four-dimensional uh, mesh of simplices in this case, right? And, and the line here is we can't generate 3D meshes, unstructured meshes very well. And now I've just said we need to do generate 4D meshes. So um, that, that's a, that is certainly one of the issues. And I'm going to talk about the issues later. So anyway, so this is the space-time adaptive approach. And that's the one I'm actually going to talk about today. Um, a reason to think about this approach is if you think about the degrees of freedom is to think about the way that it scales. So in this kind of 1D setting, the scaling of the number of degrees of freedom would be proportional to L over, sorry, L over delta squared in the uniform case. And that's because I've got to resolve the wave in both directions, in time and space. And assuming that the kind of frequency in time is related to the frequency in space by some constant, then it's going to require the same type of resolution in time as it does in space. And so I've got a L over delta squared for a uniform refinement. If I go over to the space-time AMR type of approach, that drops to uh, only being proportional to L over delta, not the square. And that's because I'm resolving this thing in a thickness that uh, the number of unknowns is going to um, scale this way. Um, and I resolve it all along this length scale. And so when you figure out the scaling of that, it reduces, you're not doing uniform, it reduces it down to L over delta. But if you have to go a long ways with a small feature, this is still very expensive, or could be very expensive. So the advantage of this is it's order one. It doesn't matter how small that feature is relative to delta. All that's going to happen is if I shrink delta, this mesh is just going to kind of get clustered more this way. Um, but it's not going to cost, uh, it doesn't really scale with the thickness compared to the uh, length of the domain. So that's what we're trying to go after is the degree of freedom reduction. Of course, uh, what we've just bought is that we're going to solve the entire space-time domain coupled. We may have a lot fewer degrees of freedom, but that's what we've just uh, said we're going to do. It also, like I said, means we're going to do 4D adaptive meshing, and we can't do that very well at this point either. Um, one thing on this bullet here, and I'll show evidence of that, is a possible advantage is related to parallel and time type techniques, which is that even though we've got kind of a causal nature in the time that we, we know is, is what happens in the PDE, the discretizations do have some time, time dependence when they're not uh, time marched like that. And as well, we've got a huge problem. We've got large CPUs, large parallel processors. We might actually be able to parallelize more effectively this space-time problem than what we can do if we do time marching. With time marching, you're only seeing one slice of your, of your entire data field. And so it's got a natural serial, built in, serial mechanism built into it. And so you've got to take how many ever time steps and only parallelize really over that one time step until you go to the next time step. So it turns out that the space-time actually will parallelize more effectively and um, uh, could have an advantage in that, that direction. So I'll show a little bit about that in a second. So let's look at some problems. So uh, again, not weather problems, uh, but this is a, um, a 1D um, reservoir type problem. So the situation here is there's a lot of oil in the middle. There's a production well that's going to draw off the oil. And then there's water on the outside. And uh, we're trying to estimate um, really what matters here is when does this water reach the well, because the well won't work when water hits it. Okay, The production well will need to be shut off. And so it's critical that you know how long that thing is going to run before the water starts to appear. So we're solving conservation, uh, conservation of mass equations with Darcy's, equation, Darcy's law um, in it. So this is the form of the equations. Um, it looks like a, convection, a diffusion system, but underneath this is an elliptic system for pressure um, and a convection diffusion system for the uh, saturation. So it's really a, um, a convection diffusion with diffusion not being too large and an uh, elliptic uh, system that sits underneath it. Saturation and pressure are what we're solving for. So here's the initial mesh in the simulation. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing the saturation. 
on this very coarse initial mesh in space time, right? And so what you see here is as the pressure is dropped, the well draws the, um, the oil into the, um, away from the reservoir into the well, and so, and then the water starts filling in, right? Very coarse simulation, but that's basically what's happening is the water is starting to make its way in and the well is, the oil is uh, uh, moving out, okay? This is showing the adjoint. Um, what we're trying to calculate here is the, uh, the uh, I don't have it here. It's the total amount of oil left in place at the time the simulation ends, okay? Um, and this is the adjoint for that particular problem. Um, let me go a little bit more and then I'll talk a little bit more about the adjoint. Oh, sorry, on the bottom here I have the error. So the blue is the error estimate using the approach I was telling you. And this is the true error because we can solve this problem very well and know exactly what the answer actually is. And so you see the true error is above the uh, error estimate. And after we've gone a couple of adaptive iterations, the true error and the estimate are, are getting better. You can see the mesh doing things you would expect. Um, it's starting to align along the fronts here. It's also refining the well a lot. The well matters here. Um, and if we go a little bit more, okay. Here's what happens. Uh, so what we're showing here is now this is 25 adaptive iterations. And after something like 10-ish, not too much is happening. And the mesh is just tweaking a little bit, but the solution error is not really changing much. And so this would be a converged adaptive process here. Uh, and this is the, the final mesh that you see. So is it, is it converged at level because there's no more degrees of freedom? Yeah, sorry, I didn't state that. Yeah, I've limited the degrees of freedom. Yeah, yeah, I should have stated that. So this is 25 iterations at whatever the degree of freedom count we picked for this was, yeah. And then, you know, so you could think about running it in different ways. You could run it for, you know, 10 iterations at one cost and then say, all right, that's, then let's go to the next cost and let's go to the next cost until you hit the, the peak cost. The results I'm going to show you were run in this fashion. We picked a degree of freedom and let the mesh optimize. I'm going to show you how, as you increase degrees of freedom, how this also impacts it. But, yeah, so fixed, fixed degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, the other thing I would point out here is what you also see is that the adaptive method doesn't just go after the flow field, right? So you, this is clearly going after the flow field, right? This is where the saturation front uh, is. But you see there's refinement occurring here where this is actually nice and smooth in here. If you looked at the pressure, the pressure is well behaved in here. What it's going after is the adjoint, which has a layer there. And you can actually theoretically show why the, that adjoint is doing that. Um, but in order to actually get the simulation accurate and do the error estimate accurate, you have to resolve the adjoint correctly. If you have a bad adjoint, you can't predict the error ac uh, accurately either. And so this adaptive method, when it's output-based, is going to go not, after, not only after the features in the primal that matter, but it's going to also go after the uh, features in the adjoint that matter. Okay. All right. So another way to say that is if you did data assimilation and you had uh, a really bad adjoint, that's just as bad as having a bad flow to do the data assimilation with. Uh, the sensitivity is going to be wrong when you do that. And that's the same thing in our error estimate. Bad adjoint means bad er error estimate, so we want to control the error in both. Okay. Just a little bit about higher order versus lower order. That simulation was done with linear P1 elements, so that's the same plot here on the left. This is now a simulation using quadratic elements. And uh, you can take a look at the, the differences. Of course, it's a coarser mesh. What we've done here is the same degree of freedom count. And since it's a P2 element, it's got more degrees of freedom per element, so there are going to be fewer elements. Okay. I'm going to show the error comparison uh, in a minute. So this is 25,000 degrees of freedom, P1 and P2. Um, one thing to notice is the mesh is a little bit different, not just that it's coarser. It doesn't go as strongly after that adjoint feature. Um, and that's because the adjoint feature lies in more inside the P2 space than it did in the P1. So the refinement pattern will be different depending on the order of polynomials you're using. You don't get the same mesh. It's not just a scaling of the P1 mesh. It's a different mesh altogether. Okay. Here's a, a plot of runtime versus error level. So x-axis here is the log of the error, error percentage, if you will. Um, and then I'm showing a bunch of different methods. Up here is sort of the standard, the equivalent of the standard industrial practice, which uses a finite volume method that's pretty much it's a first order method, okay? Um, and, and the main reason it's first order is they tend to use only first order uh, um, in time. And so the 
the spatial discretization on a nice enough mesh will be second order, but the time dependence is done usually at lower order. Um, so that's, that's sort of standard practice. And then I have a bunch of results here that are on structured meshes, space-time structured meshes, okay? Um, time marching, uh, it's just the discretization is done in space-time. And then finally, the adapted results are, are sitting over here. And so what you're seeing is, with these adapted results, significant gains for, this is time, right? So three minutes here, this is the corresponding three-minute simulation. Um, much higher errors, especially compared to the kind of standard practice done automated, and then you can see that P2 is benefiting it. Now the question is, you probably don't need this level of error. Uh, where is the error level that you actually want to be at? And with this adaptive method, even at a really coarse, you know, three minute run simulation, you get errors that are 10 to the minus four in terms of the percentage or fraction. Can you what are the each iteration? Ah, this is that last mesh. Actually, what it is is it's the average of the last five adapted meshes. Sorry. Uh, so what we do is, thank you. You run this out, and the plots that I'm showing you are for a fixed degree of freedom cost, we average the last five of these and say, all right, there's my output. OK? Um, the timing that we're showing is all of the timing from the initial mesh all the way out here. So uh, when we show the adapted meshes, even though it's, it's, it's not just the three minutes, that three minutes is the entire simulation time, right? So that includes all of the error estimates, all the mesh generation, uh, everything. So anytime I show you timings, I'm including everything in the timings for the adaptive. It's not just the final solve on the last mesh, okay? The big win here is the way these get uh, accurate is they just resolve the heck out of everything, and that causes the simulation to be very expensive. They're only doing one simulation, but it's just way more expensive than the adapted cases are. And these adaptive do a lot of work per mesh, but uh, the meshes are much coarser, right? Okay, um, 2D problem. Similar problem, but now we got a 2D setup. So I've got an injector injecting water. The producer is where the oil uh, is gonna be coming out of the ground. Um, saturation initially is 0.1, and then um, these are no flow boundaries uh, applied here. Um, I can think of anything else that's important. The output here is what's called the oil recovery factor. It's how much oil is left, or how much oil did you produce um, um, in this runtime that we do here, compared to what was in place initially, at least. Here's the way the simulation works. So this is the initial mesh, x and y, and then vertical axis here is time, okay? Very coarse initial mesh. On the left, I'm showing the pressure behavior, and uh, which doesn't do a whole heck of a lot, and here you're seeing the saturation. I'm gonna cut this mesh in a second, but what you can see here is the water has spread out from basically no water at the initial condition. Let me cut the mesh and so you can see the solution a little bit more. So what I do is I just cut this to expose the time dependence at least along the diagonal in the space time. So, so you can see not much because of how coarse this is. The pressure doesn't change all that much. Here's the, the saturation front moving. Okay, so the producer's over here. Uh, the water uh, is being pushed to drive with the combination of the pressure drop in the well. It's uh, causing the water to drive itself towards the well as the oil gets pulled off, okay. Very coarse solution, but that's the initial mesh. So run that whole adaptive process using uh, that space-time method, and here's the final adapted uh, mesh here. Um, this is the pressure. I'm gonna just look at the saturation because that's mostly what it's going after. You can see the adaptivity going along the space-time uh, front for the uh, uh, saturation front there. Um, it also is refining the, um, what the injector and the producer the entire time. Questions about the picture? Good. Yeah. So I have a question about the conservation of pain. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in terms of doing analysis, you now push some of the effort into how to analyze your data afterwards. I mean, am I correct? I mean, have you sort of looked at the cost benefit analysis of I save time, CPU time to get what I want, but how much more did it cost me to get the answers out? What, what do you, uh, just what? Uh, I'm just thinking about if you want to calculate some, some metric uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. No. So the major um, these are this is a, these are solvable problems. So I, um, an example of the type of thing that you might want to do is is let's look at what the flow field looks like at some instant in time, right? And now in order to do that, I've got to cut through, eventually I've got to cut through a 4D mesh and actually have some kind of rendering and other things that can handle that. But that's actually solvable. Uh, that's, that's not a, it's got to be done, but you do it once and then you've got a you know, software that can do it. And it's just the, it's like the first time someone ran a 3D CFD simulation, how do you visualize something in 3D on a 2D screen? Well, that, those had to be done. And once they're done, it's available. So uh, yes, there's no question. There's, it's, not, it's not like I have a time plane sitting here that I can just pull off the data. I'm going to have to cut through that and interpolate to get to a particular time plane. But you do it once, and it's done, right? So. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. So. You, yeah. So the remember now that with the finite element method, I, I've got a solution at every spot in space and time here. Right? There's no, so I just have to evaluate my basis functions at whatever spot in space and time I want. So if I want to calculate a spectra, again, let's say at, you know, whether it's a time or a, a spatial, if I want to do it, you know, I'm at the spot, tell me what the um, time spectra looks like. I'm going to slice through in time and I can do the integral to calculate, the, the, do the Fourier transform and calculate the spectra. So definitely have to do it once and it's not as easy as if it were a time marching method but once you've written the code to do that it's really just integrating through this finite element uh, solution so yeah uh, but don't get me wrong uh, it is painful because there are certain things I keep asking like oh can we get a plot of this and we're like oh yeah we got to go write that uh, and so it, it is an issue um, 4d meshing is much worse of an issue than than that though uh, so um, but definitely got to deal with it. Okay, and then here's a little bit about the um, degree of freedom, and I'm going to also show you some, some of the scaling. So what I've got here is the oil recovery factor, okay, and this middle dotted line is what we think is the right answer, okay, and then the dotted lines on either side are plus or minus 0.1 percent error, okay. And in the green and red are the two adaptive results. And if you look at this green one here, that's the P2. So I'm using quadratic elements in my space-time adapted mesh. Um, I'm increasing, these are increasing degrees of freedom. But what you see is after just, you know, basically even at the coarsest level, it's almost in the 0.1% error level um, already. P1 does a pretty good job, but just not as good as the P2. So DOF efficiency, P2 adapted, is, is uh, winning substantially. And then these are the um, other types of results. So here's the time marching sort of industry standard practice out here, okay? And it hasn't hit 0.1%. These are logs, right? So this is 10 to the ninth space time degrees of freedom compared to over here, which is 10 to the fifth uh, space time degrees of freedom. So we can get substantial compression of degrees of freedom. That, that is clear. I don't think anybody would be too surprised by that. You know, we don't have to take, another way to think about it is we're not taking fine time steps everywhere in the domain. And when a feature moves past someplace, the, uh, the space-time mesh will have a very coarse mesh in that region, and it all happens automatically. I don't have meshing that has to stay there uh, because I've, fi I've fixed it in some way. So I can get a lot of compression in my space-time um, representation through this. The question is, is it actually a winner in terms of time, really, which is what matters at the end of the day? Maybe energy uh, as well. So here's a little bit on the time. What, what I'm looking at here is I took the different results, different approaches here. And I said, all right, let's get it down to 0.1% error. So I, we ran as fine a simulation that would get us to the tenth of a percent error. Um, and then what we did is we increased, the, we ran that final uh, solution uh, with different numbers of processors. And in the adapted cases, we ran the full adaptive cycle at whatever the DOF count was. Okay? And then we're looking at how does the wall clock time change as I increase the number of processors. So number of processors isn't going that far. It's from two over to about 64, OK? Um, and then we're looking here at the wall clock time. And so the two I'm going to focus on here, the, uh, the lowest wall clock time one turns out to be using time marching, BDF2, so uh, meaning a second, BDF3, meaning a second order accurate, uh, sorry, third order accurate in time and a P2, which is nominally a third order accurate finite element method. So I've got third order in space and time, and time marching it starts out to be the lowest time um, with two processors. 
But what happens is as you increase the number of processors, that problem doesn't scale as well. And you start running into the fact that it doesn't scale as well. And now you actually lose performance as you increase the number of processors. Whereas the next best method in, um, is that space time adapted one. On two processors, wall clock time is three hours, but it continues to scale well the, the entire way. And if we had had more processors, it would continue scaling well longer. Um, so here's the scalability here. This is green is that space time P2. Space time P1 scales even, even better. And then here's the scalability of uh, the sort of um, time marching based approach. Okay. Um, Again, you have to take this with a little bit of a grain of salt because this is our optimism, this is our in parallel implementation, all of that stuff, but that's, that's what you're seeing. It, it makes sense though, we have way more data that the parallel processor is able to act on at the same time, right? Um, whereas this one, it's only seeing one you know, hundredth or one thousandth or one ten thousandth of the actual data at any one time. Okay. So, so if I look at this plot here in terms of the cost and go back and look at the other one. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah, they, they, that's, yes. Uh, certainly, in terms of DOF, it's clearly the winner, right? Um, and here, you, you could make an argument. Uh, it depends how many processors you're gonna be running on. Um, but I think, you know, this one would continue to drop here, whereas this one doesn't have enough parallelization left in it to do anything with it, so. And this is a relatively toy problem. What we think will happen is if you get to more complex problems, uh, you're likely, you're gonna be seeing a smaller and smaller fraction in your time marching of your actual data. Uh, so there's that built-in serialization, which is I think gonna really kill you. Whereas the space time one will just, it'll be able to fill up a very large machine is the reality, right? Um, so uh, remains to be seen, but this is what we're expecting to see happen. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, so I would say, um, with enough processors, the P2 adapted space time is definitely is going to win. Um, uh, but uh, in terms of DOS, it clearly wins. You know, you're manage another way to think of it too is you're managing a lot less data. You've just done data compression by like four orders of magnitude. Um, you know, that could be worth something. You know. Okay. Last problem, uh, same basic setup, but in the middle here, we have a heterogeneity. So here the uh, porosity is uh, um, decreased. So there's like a, a hard portion of rock, if you will, sitting here. And so now the flow is gonna have to make its way around this uh, um, to go between the injector and the producer. So otherwise the same basic problem, a factor of uh, 100 in porosity there. And here's the final mesh um, and and the saturation front, you can see some additivity going here and you can see how um, it's not, it's the, the saturation is making its way, the water, if you will, is making its way around that uh, barrier that's there. I'll show a few more slices of that. So this is sort of uh, somewhat your uh, question. So we slice through this data. This is not too hard because this is just slicing through a 3D mesh, right? Um, so at time 1000, here's what that mesh looks like. Now it's again, it's a slice through a bunch of tetrahedra really, okay, but what you can see is at time 1,000, okay, it's interested in the well. Um, it's got, probably this is where the front is sitting at that point. It's interested in, sorry, this is the well. Uh, this is the well, this is the injector. And then it's, it's also refining a little bit the discontinuity and the permeability, okay. So this matters to the solution, even though the wave hasn't gotten there, but this affects the pressure behavior. Right, you've got an elliptic pressure equation underneath having a discontinuity in the permeability affects the way the pressure behaves. And the output-based adaptivity is saying it matters right now. Okay, but what's interesting is it's not saying it matters so much in other parts where the discontinuity is. For some reason, this part is the adaptive indicator saying that's where it matters. And here's at time 2000. Now it's more interested Presumably it's probably because the saturation front, I don't know for sure, I'm speculating. The saturation front has started to hit here and now it's saying, okay, I gotta refine this boundary a little bit more. And here's that 3,000, okay. Okay, so that's, that's uh, the, the type of uh, result that um, we're able to get with this space-time method, okay. Um, all right, so challenges. I've already mentioned one of them which is 4D meshing. So uh, we've got a student that generated a 4D metric-based mesher. 
Um, right now, the boundary of the domains has to be planar. Uh, it doesn't have to be just this, uh, okay, in, we're in 4D here, so uh, this is a hypercube. Um, what I'm showing you here, uh, this, this, I still never get this right, but I'm showing you the boundaries of our four-dimensional uh, um, hypercube, right? Um, so here's the t equals one boundary, which is a 3D volume, you know, t zero boundary. Um, this is for a problem where you have a spherical wave that starts out at you know, R0 and over the time of the simulation runs, it ends up at RF, okay? And so it's just a wave propagation. And so our visualization, again, at your point, we can only visualize the boundaries of our 4D uh, um, domain right now, so this is, this is what I can show you. Um, we're working on all the other stuff that has to be done. Um, so we have some initial capability to generate 4D meshes um, on simple enough domains, um, but that's uh, ongoing work uh, to get that more up to speed. Um, the other biggie is, is chaos. Uh, this is work from uh, the uh, atmospheric community. Um, what we're looking at here is the, what is being looked at here by Lee uh, et al. is the Lorenz system. Um, and in particular, what's being plotted is uh, the sensitivity versus the R parameter in the Lorenz system calculated uh, using, in this case, it was using an adjoint method, but it could have been a forward method. So this is how sensitive is the average Z uh, with respect to the um, uh, thermal, thermal gradient. Um, this is calculated with an adjoint method. Uh, what you see is, it's hard to pick up on this scale, is that you probably are getting reasonable answers for um, uh, some small values, but as the system finally produces chaos, you get blow up immediately. And so, you know, 10 to the 20, 10 to the 40, 10 to the 60. And what's happening is the well-known phenomena that this linear system, the linearized states are unstable. They grow exponentially in time. If you have a long enough time, then your linearized behavior is gonna predict essentially infinite uh, sensitivity. And so the sensitivity data you get back is, is not very useful. Um, and the issue is our error estimation directly depends on solving an adjoint, a linearized error analysis. So if we go to apply this to a turbulent flow, um, we're immediately going to run into this. And roughly speaking, what's going to happen is it's going to say everything is important because the error is going to light up everywhere. You're going to get exponential blow up. In general, you're going to get it everywhere. Okay. So we need, to, uh, we need to change the way we're doing the error estimation away from this linearized model for turbulent flow problems. So that, that to me is actually, that might be the worst problem. Um, I'm not sure, 4D meshing is not gonna be easy either. So that's, that's the whole story here. Um, we're trying to work towards the solution to some of those problems. Uh, the space-time effort is relatively uh, new, new for us, especially looking about chaotic problems. And I wanna thank also the uh, organizations that have funded us over the last several years, so thanks. Thank you, and we, we are recording this, so please, if you have a question, raise your hand, I'll pass the mic around. Uh, any questions? You all were so active during the talk. <laughs> mm, thank you, Paul. I missed for your point. So how did you calculate the error for the 2D case reservoir simulation? Uh, so the... Um, Two things, anytime I'm actually showing you something and I'm calling it the error, it's because we solved on a very fine mesh, finer than anything I'm showing you results for, and we're using that as the exact answer uh, for any of the ones I showed here. Um, so we don't actually use the exact answer in the adaptive process. I'm just using it to be able to show you that we actually do converge to the correct solution, okay? So the error estimate, though, is, used, is using this uh, um, dual weighted, what's called the dual weighted residual approach, where we calculate the truncation error through the residual, multi solve the adjoint, do the inner product, the integral of the adjoint times the residual. All of our estimates are done that way, that drive the system. So, so any of the problems where I've shown you error, it's because we've calculated a really fine mesh solution, um, and we're hoping that that's a good enough representation of the actual value. Okay, thank okay. you. Can I also have a thing? Yeah. Okay, so 
Mm, probably this question is not highly related to the topic, but uh, physically, like the, you mentioned, the heterogeneity affects the uh, reservoir modeling. And also, the how, how, how to mention also affects the reservoir modeling. So, uh, based on your experience, do you think like um, uh, how how much like the mesh contribute to yeah. the error? Like yeah. probably the heterogeneity dominate all the mesh. Yes, um, good question. So um, I think you can get a little sense of that. Uh, okay, I don't have that plot, do I? I need to get that plot. So uh, it's not too different than than this plot. You'll uh, I can show you it. Um, this is timing, but um, the adaptive mesh makes usually a two to three orders of magnitude lower error uh, for these types of problems, and that's including the one that had the heterogeneity in it. So um, the uh, the adapt so there's a kind of a key point here is that when you Go to higher order, it's even more important, I think, that you have adaptive methods because uh, for most problems that we're interested in, you don't actually have the required smoothness in most of the domains, uh, most of the flows that we're interested in. And the only way you're going to get a higher order method that will work well is if you can refine the regions that are irregular um, so that the rest of the smooth portion of the region can be done efficiently with a higher order representation. So, um, you know, if you have a really nice smooth problem, if you imagine a direct numerical simulation of something that's really smooth, um, then higher order will clearly pay off, uh, will be more efficient. But the issue is in problems where you don't have that smoothness, um, the higher order method will only pay off if you've refined the regions that are going to drop the accuracy. Okay. So, um, so the, that's a long-winded way to say we see the benefits in um, uh, whether it's DOF or time when we go to higher order, but we only see that when its uh, um, refinement is, is there. That heterogeneity will cause a lack of regularity that will ruin the higher order convergence otherwise. So, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. uh, very nice talk. Um, Thanks, yeah. So regarding the future directions, I can see the 4D meshing being Hard, yeah. to say the least, <laughs> yes. but, but being possible and being yeah. able to extend the, the metric-based adaptation strategies that you've talked about. Yeah. Um, but I agree that the, the adjoint-based approach to optimizing the mesh, we have to rethink things. Now, yeah. I know that folks in your own department, like Chi Chi, yeah. have been answering um, or trying to answer, trying to answer um, yeah. this question of how, how do we uh, adapt. Um, what are your thoughts on, on what might be possible strategies moving forward? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, all right, so uh, these are some of the ones I'm thinking about. So um, one is uh, some systems, the compressible navier Stokes being one of them, have uh, uh, entropy um, stability uh, properties to them. And, and so um, what you, and interestingly, the entropy variables themselves can be thought of as an adjoint uh, um, variable as well. So it, it sort of makes, it links back into the, um, this dual way to residual approach. But the idea is you multiply the residual by these adjoint variables, okay, and the adjoint, sorry, by the entropy variables, and these are nonlinear functions of the solution. They're just the solution in another variable set. So they're well behaved, they're bounded. So you can actually use, this is really just using the entropy residual for doing adaptivity. So I think one of the directions is probably we're gonna have to live with using residual based things where you do some weighting, and the weighting in one case I'm thinking about would be the, an adjoint-based weighting. Really what you're adapting on is, adjoint, is entropy error in that case, okay? But I think there may be ways to, to do something similar where you can imagine a nonlinear uh, function of the state variables um, that's not directly the, ad, not a linear adjoint uh, that might do something similar to the adjoint. Uh, so I, I don't know for sure. I think we need to, um, so first step is I think residual based refinement uh, and I think I would do entropy residual uh, in that case, okay. 
There are other games that you could think about. I'm not so optimistic. Things like only adapt for a certain amount of time and so that the uh, adjoint, the linear system, can't blow up. You know, so you, you go as far as that Lyapunov exponent, uh, the worst case scenario, will allow you to go before you get saturation at some, whatever you think you can live with. And then you go the next step and you do that ag again and again. I think that's doomed to failure. Um, uh, but, you know, that might be a way. I know that's a way that people have looked at it in the data assimilation uh, community also, is to do ensemble averages over short periods of time. I'm not a big fan, but maybe. So the answer is I don't have a good solution is really the answer, uh, uh, but that's a, it's a real problem. And I share your belief that we can do 4D meshing eventually, but um, we'll see about this. So, yeah. Anybody have any good thoughts about that one, by the way? What's the weather modeling community do with adjoints that blow up uh, as you start to resolve the? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One-ish. Uh, yeah. So, so in data simulation, in terms of uh, replacing a join model with uh, just ensemble uh, representation, the biggest issue is the sampling error right. in terms of how information are related across the time space. Uh, we need to reduce the sampling noise yep. with the limited resources. So yep. that's the, another big chunk of uh, work we need to do. So yep. currently, I think it, it's, it shares some kind of flavor of how difficult this problem is because you're resolving a lot of fine scale uh, features in your A joint, yeah. which cause the problem. But in the ensemble world, it will also cause the problem via the sampling noises. Yeah. So I think uh, my my thought of how this can carry forward is to try to tackle the problem by separating the scales. Maybe <laughs> only capture the coarse grain uh, features in the A joint or ensemble representation, yeah. Yeah. so that they are accurate, and you refine the problem gradually with. Uh, in, putting in more and more fine scale uh, details after some uh, previous right. iteration has, have completed. Yeah, I mean, you know, for long time behaviors, the, this is work that one of my colleagues has looked at, but he didn't come up with the idea either. For, for uh, well behaved chaotic systems, uh, ergodic uh, type systems, there are ways to define well to have well-defined sensitivities defined. It's just the solution to that is so expensive that it's not practical. And so um, theoretically, though, there are sensitivities for chaotic systems that, that do make sense and do exist, but you, it's not practical to calculate them is the issue. So um, you know, an option is if someone can figure out how to efficiently calculate this sens sensitivity, then you could actually, for some cases, actually make progress on it. Um, what I've seen is it works, these methods work and they're barely survivable for low dimensional problems, but they're not going to be survivable for, you know, billions of unknowns, uh, billions of states that we're, you know, or, or more that we're thinking about. So. Okay. okay. Thanks. Since yeah. it's well yeah. after four now, we should thank David once again. Yeah. Thank you.